we begin our worship with prayer. O Lord God Almighty, you shine forth in glorious splendor. On Mount Sinai, your glory shone brilliantly so that even the face of Moses shone, reflecting your glory. Your glory shines forth in even greater splendor through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through his gospel of salvation. We rejoice to be able to come into your presence today to behold your glory here in your word. Shine brightly into our hearts and transform us into the likeness of your glory for Jesus' sake. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. will be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the front of the worship supplement. This Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday. It deals with the glory of God as it has been revealed. We see God's glory revealed in amazing and miraculous ways throughout the scriptures. On Mount Sinai, God revealed his glory in a cloud and smoke. He revealed his glory in a pillar of fire and cloud over the children of Israel. Jesus revealed his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, glowing and shining brightly. But God also reveals his glory to us through his word, revealing who he is and what he has done in order to deliver us from sin. It is that glory that we focus on in our worship service today. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserved only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. 
In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give us strength to live according to his will. Amen. Lord God, in the glorious transfiguration of your Son, you confirmed the testimony of Moses and the prophets, and in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wondrously foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully, make us co-heirs with Jesus, our King, and bring us to your glorious home in heaven, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this weekend is found recorded for us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. We read there the words of the Apostle Peter. Therefore, beloved, Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. During the season of Epiphany, we often have connections to the glory of the Lord or the revelation of the Lord's glory to God's word. We think of the wise men 
who came and worshiped Jesus. They realized God had led them through the light of the star to where that young child was. The question is, how did they know to follow the star? Well, these people came from the area where Daniel was in captivity hundreds of years earlier. There was a message about this promised savior who would come for all the world. They knew these promises that comes from God's word. So while the star was what led them to where Jesus was, it was God's word that revealed to them that there would be a savior that would come in their place for their salvation. And it is that light of God's word that continues to direct us on our path today. The apostle Peter speaks about how people who don't study the scriptures or are unfamiliar with the scriptures are in danger of twisting the scriptures to their own desires. Instead of allowing God to speak to us through his word, asking God to open our hearts that we might know what it is that he wants of us, what he has done for us in the person of Jesus. He says that we are to grow in our grace and in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus through that word so that we won't be susceptible to errors or false teaching, but continue to be trusting in the work that God has accomplished for us. In our gospel reading from Mark chapter nine, we have the account of the transfiguration of Jesus as he demonstrates his glory, reveals his glory to his disciples so that they would realize that he was more than just a man, that he was the promised Messiah, their savior from sin and death. We read from Mark nine. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the son of man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the son of man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Jesus was speaking there about John the Baptist. The scriptures point out that Elijah was, who was spoken of in the book of Malachi, long after the prophet Elijah had died. Elijah the prophet was looking ahead to the coming of John the Baptist. And the people had rejected the message of John the Baptist. And Herod had had Elijah, uh, John the Baptist put to death. Once again, we see the rejection of the world to the message of Jesus pointing to him as the only savior from sin and from death. Please rise. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it.
join to make confession of our faith in that action of God for us, the revelation of his glory in the person of Jesus. We'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 15 in the worship supplement. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 446.
please rise. Every word of God is pure, and it has been recorded for our instruction in righteousness. The word of God, which we're meditating on this morning, is found recorded for us in the first 12 verses of Psalm 139, as they're printed in your bulletin. To the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. This is the word of our God. Please be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who is the radiance and the glory of the Father, Revealed to us in human form, dear fellow redeemed. In Transfiguration, we often think about the glory of the Lord. We think about Peter, James, and John <coughs> standing there as they followed Jesus up onto the Mount of Transfiguration and seeing this man that they knew that was their, their rabbi, their teacher, their friend, brilliantly glorified before their eyes. In addition to that, they see two individuals from the Old Testament brought back from the dead, so to speak, standing there and speaking with Jesus about his exit from this world, his work as our Savior, his death on the cross. It's an amazing thing. Peter, James, and John, as we saw in our gospel reading, they didn't want to leave the Mount of Transfiguration. It was so brilliant, so wonderful, that they wanted to stay there. Peter suggested, let's build three tents so that we can stay here for a while. Isn't it often like that for us as Christians? We're studying God's word and God reveals his word to us. It can be in a worship service. It can be in Bible study. It can be in our own reading of the scriptures. And we see something revealed that we've never understood or thought of before. God reveals his glory. And that's one thing to be here in church, here in Bible class, maybe even in the privacy of our own home. But it's different when we have to walk out the doors and return to the world. Hopefully there are times, just like Peter, James, and John, where we just want to relish in the glory of what God reveals to us through his word, the truths, the promises that he makes to us as sinful human beings. And yet, just like with Peter, James, and John, we don't have that freedom, that privilege. We don't get to stay here all week long. We don't get to continue on in our study of the scripture as we would like or desire. We have to return to the everyday world and take that revelation of God's glory with us. The hopes and the promises that he makes, they go with us into the real world, into the problems and the despair and the trouble 
that we face every single day. When we think about the glory of the Lord, there are generally two major reactions. We see it with Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. When they see the brilliance of Jesus' glory, we're told by Mark that they were afraid. Fear is one of the very first reactions when we are exposed to the glory of God. And it was true in the Old Testament as well. When God revealed his glory on Mount Sinai, the children of Israel said, we don't want to go up there. Moses, you go up for us. You find out what it is that he's got to say. When God revealed his glory to the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, in the vision in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah couldn't help but cry out, Woe is me, for I am unclean, and I dwell among a people that are unclean. Even Peter, James, and John earlier on, when they first came into contact with Jesus during his ministry, when Jesus told them to take the boat out after they had put their nets away, and he said, get those nets out again and put them in for a catch of fish. And hesitatingly, they did that. And the Lord filled the nets full of fish. Do you remember Peter's response? Peter said, depart from me, Lord. He said, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be here in your presence, knowing who you are, what you are. I am a man of unclean lips. One of our first reactions when we see the glory of the Lord, when we see the revelation of who he is, is fear. <clears throat> it's fear because the glory of the Lord reveals not only who he is, it also reveals what we are. It reveals that we are full of sin, that we are in desperate need of deliverance, of salvation, because we can't fix that problem on our own. Peter, James, and John, Isaiah, Moses, it doesn't matter where it is that the Lord reveals his glory. We realize that first and foremost is our problem. God has the solution for our problem of sin. As we look at these verses from Psalm 139, just the 12, first 12 verses of this longer psalm, we see the Lord's glory being revealed. The Lord reveals who he is, what he is capable of. He reveals his glory to sinful mankind. And while our first reaction to a revelation like this about who Jesus is, about who God is, is fear because of our sin, David causes us to rejoice. He realizes that he wants us to know that God, because of who he is, gives us hope. Hope in the salvation that he has won for sinners such as us. As we take a look at these first 12 verses, we'll take a look at two major attributes of the Lord. And we will see that his knowledge, his omniscience, shines through our doubt in this fallen world. And that his presence or his omnipresence, being present everywhere, shines through our despair. We pray that the Holy Spirit would bless our study and our meditation on these verses from Psalm 139. Amen. David begins the opening verse of our text, Psalm 139, saying, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Remember how the revelation of God's glory, the first reaction, first fitting and appropriate reaction is fear. When we hear these words of David, when he describes this attribute of God, that he is all-knowing, when we reflect on what we are, 
what we do, what we think in our average everyday life, it should cause us to be a little bit afraid. David says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. In other words, there is nothing that we can do that is hidden from the Lord. There is nothing that we have said in private about someone else that the Lord doesn't know. There is nothing that we've done in the darkest room of our home that the Lord doesn't know that we've done. The Lord is there, everywhere. Wherever we might be, whatever we might be doing, the Lord knows it. In fact, David even goes on and he says, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. The very thoughts that aren't even expressed in word, the thoughts that we have of hate for other people, the frustrations that we have, our natural human inclination toward our fellow man, God knows every one of them. And just like Isaiah, when we realize the glory of the Lord as it is revealed here, we too should say, woe is me, I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And the Lord knows every sin, every sinful thought, every sinful deed that I've ever done. That should undo us. The realization of who the Lord is. What the Lord is. And yet, it isn't just that response of fear that is the reason why David reveals these attributes of God. Yes, we should recognize that God knows everything that we've done, and hopefully that causes us to think before we do or say certain things in our lives, realizing that God knows what we do and what we think and what we say. But there's also great comfort in this attribute of God, that God is omniscient. David goes on in verse five, he says, you hem me in behind and before, you lay your hand upon me. David realizes that this attribute of God, that he knows everything that we might face in this life, every trouble, every fear, every disappointment, that that is a comforting thing for us. In fact, the Lord even knows things about our lives that we don't know. He's there before us and behind us. He's like a shield before and behind us, protecting us from the troubles that we've never faced because he protected us from them. And yes, we do go through many difficulties in this life, but those are just the ones that we know. Those don't include the ones that the Lord protected us from, that he kept us from the times that he was watching over us and preserved us from trouble. You hem me in both behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. When you think about David, you think about the events that David faced in his life, you can understand why this attribute of God was such a comfort for him. The times when Saul was hunting him down and David admits, I didn't do anything to deserve it. Yes, David was sinful. David made mistakes and the Lord knew that. But there were also times where David was innocent and he was being chased for no reason that he had brought on himself, but just because of the wicked world around him. And the Lord knows that too. The Lord knows when we are the ones who were being chased and afflicted and persecuted, when we are doing the right thing even though the world doesn't see it that way. The Lord says through David, yes, I'm going to be there with you. I'm gonna hem you in. I'm gonna protect you both behind and before. And I'm going to put my hand of power and comfort on you and realize, yes, I will give my angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. God is there with us no matter what we might face. And what does that lead David to say? He says in verse six, 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. What a wonderful blessing to know that the omniscience of God, while it causes us to recognize our own sin, our own failures before God, before our fellow men, that God is there. He understands our sin, but he also understands the, the things that we face in this life that we are innocent of. And he is right there with us through it all, guarding us and protecting us. David not only points to the fact that the knowledge of God, his omniscience, shines through the doubts, the concerns, the fears that we have in this life. But then he goes on and he points to his omnipresence. The fact that it's not just that God knows our struggles, but that he's present with us in those struggles. And his presence shines through the despair that we might face. In verse 7, David continues on. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. It isn't enough to know that God is just knowledgeable about what we go through in this life, what we struggle with in this life. David says God not only knows what you face, he's present with you in all that you face. No matter where you go, no matter where you might be, God is right there. Now again, the omnipresence of God, the revelation of that glory of who he is and what he's capable of, it can lead us to fear. In fact, when you think about verse seven, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? It might remind us of a familiar account in the Old Testament. Jonah, who when he was called by the Lord to go to the city of Nineveh in order to preach the gospel to them, he thought he could get away from God. He thought he could find a place where God wasn't. And he hopped on a ship heading in the opposite direction. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? The answer is nowhere. There's nowhere that we can go to get away from God, to hide from God. There's no place where we can hide our sin where God isn't there and he doesn't know what it is that we have done. We can't run away from the responsibilities, the callings that the Lord has given to us. We can try, but the Lord knows exactly where we are. He knows exactly what we are doing. The Lord says, if, if you ascend even into heaven, and by heaven we're not talking about the abode of God, but the heavens, into the sky, into outer space. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that is in the grave, in the depths of the earth, behold, O Lord, you are there. <clears throat> If I take to the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. There's nowhere that we can go that God isn't. There's a, an astronaut. He was part of the Apollo 15 moon landings. In 1971, he was a nominal Christian. Went to church from time to time. He had been raised in a Christian home. But in 1971, he was part of the Apollo 15 moon landings. They went to the moon. And he was carried a task with carrying out certain experiments, tests on the moon. And he couldn't get this test, this piece of equipment to function properly. And he tells the story later on. He said, I prayed. And he said God's glory was revealed. He said he realized where he was. He was on the moon. And yet he knew that God was there. And he figured out what the problem was with the equipment. And it changed his life. He came back from the Apollo 15 moon landings no longer a nominal Christian. In fact, 
there's a quote, a transcript for while he was up on the moon, as he, he actually quotes from one of the Psalms, that it reminded him as he saw the moons of the creation of the world, that God was there. There's nowhere that we can go where God isn't. Later on, he wrote, he had a picture, a photo of him on the moon with one of these lunar landings. And he wrote it to a friend. He put his autograph on there and he put the reference to Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. He came to realize that there was nowhere that you could go from God. That God is there everywhere, no matter where we might be, no matter if we're on the moon, or no matter if we're in a submarine at the bottom of the ocean, God is there. No matter what it is that we might face as simple as a little test that we're trying to carry out on the moon, or if our nuclear submarine is malfunctioning and we might not make it to the surface, God is there. It doesn't really matter. He says, even there, no matter where we might be, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. The presence of the Lord, the revelation of the knowledge that God is present with us anywhere and everywhere we might be, it shines through the despair, through the fear, through the concerns of this life, realizing that God is more powerful than anything that we might face. That he doesn't just know what it is that we're struggling with. He is present with us through the struggle. Even there, your right hand shall hold me. Jim Irwin came to realize that. We don't have to go to the moon to realize that God is with us no matter where we might be. God reveals that to us right here in the simple verses of Psalm 139. And then David takes us to the very end of this life. He says in verse 11, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. David is describing death here. Think about what it's like to face death. The uncertainty, the unknown, the fear that goes along with that uncertainty. Wondering what's on the other side. Wondering what, whether those things that we've held to be true and the promises that God has made to us, whether they will really come true or not. There's all kinds of little temptations that the devil throws at us when we're facing death. And David says, surely the darkness shall cover me. Sooner or later, sooner or later, Unless the Lord comes first, we're all going to face death. The darkness shall cover me. But he says, but the light about me will be as night. <coughs> death is not the end. Not for the Christian. Death just simply opens up that door to the light that God has revealed for us and that he has won for us through his own death and resurrection. The glory of the Lord revealed for eternity in the presence of God. Even in death, David says, the darkness is not dark to you. What is it that's on the other side? Our Savior Jesus. The one who has defeated death for us. The one who reminds us that yes, we do walk through the valley of the shadow of death but that Jesus, through his own death, through his resurrection on the third day, he has defeated death once and for all. And on the other side is that same Savior, the same Savior who has redeemed us as his very own. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. The Lord reminds us of who he is. He reveals his glory in the fact that he knows everything. He's omniscient. And his omniscience, it shines through the doubt and the fear that we have in this life. And the fact that he is present with us in his power, using his power for our good, conquering death and sin, and giving us the hope of light on the other side of death, that too shines through the despair, the fear of this life, pointing us to our Savior. Peter, James, and John had the privilege of seeing Jesus glorified before them on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
But we have the privilege of seeing that same Jesus revealed in all his glory right here in Psalm 139. And knowing that we will see that same Jesus revealed in all of his glory, just as Peter, James, and John did, once the Lord takes us from this valley of tears to himself in heaven. Thanks be to the Lord who has revealed his glory to us that we might know the hope that is ours in eternity. May he comfort us in fear and trouble with that assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Continue with the singing of hymn 43.
please rise for prayer. Almighty God, your eyes are on the righteous and your ears are open to their prayers. And so we ask that you would hear the prayer of your people and give to us all needed things for the health of our bodies as well as our souls. O oh Lord God, we praise you for the precious gift of your Son. We give you our thanks, especially on this day, for the revelation of your will in our Savior's glorious transfiguration on the mountain. By this sign, give to us and to all your people a clearer vision and a higher knowledge of Christ. Grant that as we behold the radiance of his glory with eyes of faith, that we may know him and believe in him as the very light of the world, the express image of your own divine being. Keep us always mindful of our words spoken. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Give us of your Holy Spirit so that our trust in your Son is renewed and strengthened every day. By the sign which you gave when Moses and Elijah spoke with Jesus, give to us renewed confidence that those who sleep in death are always alive to you because of your grace in Christ. As we go forth into our daily lives, let the promise of that future glory in Christ go with us in all that we think, say, or do, let the light of your love show forth for others to see so that they might glorify you and come to know the gift of your grace by faith in Jesus. Transform our weak and our sinful lives into the radiance of your goodness, of your joy and love. Take our sicknesses, our pains, our wounds, and our hurts. Take our disappointments, our defeats, and our despair, Take our sorrow and mourning. Take even our pride and anger, our selfishness and envy. Take all of these and transform them by the power of your word into pure motives, kind thoughts, helpful deeds, courage, joyful spirit, and true faith. And when our last hour shall come, preserve us in the faith which you have begun in us, so that we shall awaken to a bright, glorious, and eternal reign in heaven with you, as well as all those who place their trust in you. It is in the name of our Savior Jesus that we ask all of these things, and in his name in which we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against <coughs> us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing and promise of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated.